meeting, we're ready to start. Uh, welcome to the ARO seminar series centered around the topic of middle year. Uh, today we're delighted to have Dr. Jehun Sim as our speaker. My name is Ivo Dobrev and I'll be your, your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before we start, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function directed at me to avoid any interrupting of the presentation. Uh, following the presentation, feel free to unmute and ask questions directly. Any questions that are not addressed um, now uh, will be answered later by the presenter in a follow-up email. Uh, closed captioning for this meeting is available for your use and this session is being recorded um, and will be made available for uh, later viewing. Our speaker today, uh, Dr. Jehun Sim, he is, uh, the leading, is the lead um, on the research on middle year at the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Hospital of Zurich. He obtained his uh, bachelor degree and master's degree at the Department of Mechanical Design and Product Engineering at Seoul National University and his PhD degree at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University. His research focuses um, has been on both basic science on middle year mechanics as well as clinical research on middle year surgeries. He has performed measurements on three-dimensional motion um, of the middle ear or sicker chain, microimaging for detailed middle ear anatomy, numerical simulation of middle ear models for his research on middle ear mechanics, and experimental assessments of surgical outcomes of various middle ear implants, depending on surgical parameters and anatomical variants for his clinical research. I personally have had the pleasure of knowing and working with Dr. Sim for almost 10 years now. Uh, during which we have collaborated on um, a wide range of topics, uh, including mechanics of hearing, um, specifically on the spatial motion of the malleosynchus complex, as well as the mechanics of bone conduction transmission. And now, uh, without any further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sim, who will be presenting his work titled Mechanics of Human Middle Ear, Theory and Measurements, the Three-Dimensional Behavior of the Human Middle Ear. So, um, Dr. Sim, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ibo, for introducing me. Uh, well, hello, so nice to, to see you, everybody. Today, I would like to like uh, provide uh, technical details to measure three-dimensional motion of the human middle ear. Of course, these techniques can be applied to other species, such as rodents, or any other lab animals. So today I will deal uh, two types of behavior of the middle ear structures. First is a vibration during uh, middle ear sound transmission for hearing perception. And then, well, we usually measure this uh, vibrational motion uh, using the laser Doppler vibrometer. The second type uh, behavior is aesthetic behavior under uh, change of ambient aesthetic pressures. Uh, well, there are many ways to measure the aesthetic behavior, but uh, uh, we uh, use the stereo camera system to measure this aesthetic behavior of the structures. So uh, I would like to start from the uh, vibrational motion of the middle structures. Uh, uh, and the measurement using laser the flow vibrometer. So this vibration of human middle ear structures occur uh, during the middle ear sound transmission for hearing perception, and the magnitude of this motion is very, very small, uh, even up to nanoscale. And then uh, so like motion patterns are very simple, and low frequencies with reduced degrees of freedom, and then it becomes uh, complex and spatial at high frequencies generally. As you see, like uh, it's, uh, oscular chain motion is uh, very complex and spatial, uh, including some like uh, not only the translational motion, also uh, some rotational motions. And then this magnitude of the motion is very small. So I would like to show the real magnitude of motion we measured.
yeah, maybe you cannot see anything because uh, this amount of motion is really, really small. The magnitude of motion uh, during the middle of sound transmission is very small. It's up to like a size of water molecule. So considering the spatial complexity and this small magnitude of the motion, so measuring the vibrant and motion of the middle structure is very challenging. So one of the methods widely used uh, to measure this vibrational motion is using laser Doppler vibrometer, so LDB system. So well, this uh, LDB system use well uses the Doppler effect to measure vibrational motion, and then uh, minimum measurable uh, amount is that about like uh, uh, zero point eight nanometer at one kilohertz. Uh, this method provides non-contact and sensitive and very reliable and accurate measurement. So well this is one of the widest like I used or uh, used widely used uh, to measure this vibrational motion of the middle ear structures. We also just some please sorry For the easy control of the, this LDB system, uh, we prepared this robot arm, and then we mounted this uh, LDB system to uh, the robot arm uh, for easy control of the position, and then also accurate position of the, the accurate control of position of the, this LDB system. So I would like to show two examples we performed to measure uh, vibrational motion of the middle ear structures using LDB systems. First thing is that uh, well, like measurement of 3D vibration of the middle ear ossicles. And then second example is the measurement of 3D vibration of the tympani membrane. Big difference is that these middle ear ossicles can be uh, considered as rigid during vibration. Uh, as you imagine, like uh, this tympanic membrane is flexible, so uh, it cannot be considered as rigid body during vibration. So let me start from the measurement of three-dimensional vibration of middle ear ossicles. First of all, well, let's assume that each bone is rigid during vibration. Then, 3D portion of all rigid body motion can be represented by three translational components of a reference point and three rotational components in a reference frame. So, it has uh, three uh, component in translation, and the three component in the rotation. So, totally, we have a six component. So. Uh, three-dimensional motion of a rigid body can be considered uh, motion with six degrees of freedom. To determine these six components of a rigid body motion, we need 3D motion components of at least three non-linear non-collinear points and coordinate of the measurement point. So to define rigid body motion over rigid, uh, like rigid body motion, we should measure uh, these two things: is uh, velocity components of at least three non-collinear points and coordinates of the measurement points. Uh, so actually, this uh, rigid body motion is nonlinear. But if we assume that magnitude of vibration, magnitudes of vibration are very very small compared to the dimensions of a rigid body, then we can linearize uh, the rigid body motion. So these equations shows uh, linearized rigid body motion. And then here, like uh, well. Uh, velocity at the arbitrary point M on the rigid body can be represented by 
translation of reference point plus angular velocity plus product uh, the, the, well, the displays I mean, root, uh, position vectors. So this uh, vector form can, can be written as like this. Then uh, this can be uh, written by vector form like this. So then for n points, this n should be uh, larger than three or equal to three on a rigid body uh, to determine the rigid body motion components. Then equation becomes like this. Then the, by the normal equation, this is called the normal equation or the, it's a, uh, another expression of the uh, least scale error method. So by measuring coordinates and 3D motion components at endpoints, digital body motion components VR can be obtained. So now uh, I would like to explain how uh, this uh, coordinate and this, uh, 3D motion components can be measured at endpoints. So first of all, uh, which like uh, uh, if we measure the velocity component VML of the point M in the uh, and, uh, in the specific direction, uh, this velocity components can be uh, represented by the velocity vector uh, that inner product and then the this unit directional vectors. So if we measure from the three different directions, then equation becomes like that. Then uh, XYG component, uh, velocity component at the point M can be obtained by like this. So, by measuring velocities along three different directions, 3D velocity uh, at the point M can be obtained. So to make three different positions, well, a uh, long time ago, Dick Kramer, Dr. Dick Kramer introduced way to use two stacked goniometers. They changed uh, relative angle between the LDB, LDB laser beam and samples uh, using the, these two stacked gonia mirrors. And then uh, like uh, they measured from more than three different directions and then they obtained uh, 3D component, velocity component at a specific point on the rigid body. But uh, this, well, this works uh, very rigorous, but Nowadays, with 3D LDB system, uh, where the three built-in laser beams are built in this system, we can uh, directly measure the 3D velocity component of a specific point. And then I said that we need velocity component at a, uh, some uh, several point. Also, we need uh, like a coordinates of the point. To measure the, well, the coordinate uh, of the some specific point, generally this specimen is like mounted on the micro stage. And then, so well, in-plane coordinate can be obtained by the micro, or by reading the micro stages. And then for the jet coordinate, we use like a, this fixed, Length of the focal point from uh, from the LDB head to the focal point of the three laser beams. Then, uh, by moving uh, this three D LDB, we can read the coordinate of the these laser beam directions. But a problem is that uh, this three D LDB has a very very small angles between these. 
uh, three laser beams. So, well, it's not easy to accurate the coordinates along the, these laser beam directions. So, well, errors in laser beam directions is uh, 10 times as large as uh, the errors in other directions. To overcome this problem, uh, generally we use the, the ray trace that is uh, like, a, like a in plane coordinates by reading the obtained by reading the micro stages uh, well, more or less reliable, but uh, coordinates in direction is not so reliable. So we use generally use the like uh, uh, ray tracing is uh, is uh, with an extension of a virtual laser beam directions, and then. Uh, this surface of the ossicles can be obtained in micro images. So we just uh, detect uh, the like interface intersection between the virtual laser beam direction and then surface of the object. Then we identify the point uh, in these directions. Then. We also intrinsic anatomical frame uh, to compare measurement across samples. Uh, there are many ways to define this anatomical frame. So I would like to show some, some examples uh, I used to define this anatomical frame. So like uh, uh, first example is that uh, like XY plane was defined uh, the plane uh, to fit to the annulus of the tympani membrane, and then uh, like a, a direction of the menu, malleus manubrium was uh, defined as y axis. The second example was that the, well, I used the foot plate to define this anatomical plane. Uh, the plane uh, fitted to the median surface of the foot plate as the uh, defined as XY plane, and then a centroid of the median surface of the clay was the tip, uh, like a set as the origin. The third example is that uh, well, direction was the same as uh, the example two, but uh, the, I said uh, this uh, uh, like a, uh, Mass of cent center of mass as the origin, the center of mass of the values in this complex uh, as the origin of this uh, anatomical frame. So, well, how to uh, define this anatomical frame is like uh, is dependent to your decision, but it should be very like uh, unique. Uh, unique means. Uh, uh, it should be defined uniquely, independently of the person who defined the this anatomical frame, and then uh, it should be defined very accurately. Otherwise, uh, comparison between uh, across like samples also comparison with the other studies is not possible. So this equation shows uh, how we correlate. Uh, the anatomical frame to the LDB frame because measurement is done with uh, in this LDB frame, but finally uh, we register all results into this intrinsic anatomical frame. Uh, so I generally use like uh, several reference markers, and then I measure coordinates of the markers in the LDB frame, and then. Also, uh, I measured the coordinates of the reference markers in interest plane, and then, uh, like, uh, well, to relate these two coordinate system, uh, I calculated the rotational matrix and translational matrix, and then, or uh, to calculation this like uh, this rotational matrix is uh, like has a nonlinear component. So calculation is very com yeah, complicated if we introduce Euler angles, but uh, there are ways uh, to define 
uh, uh, to calculate its rotational matrix without iteration. So this formula uh, is showing the way how we calculate this rotational matrix and transitional matrix. So if coordinates of at least three uh, reference markers are measured in the LGB frame and intrinsic frame, then correlation between two frames can be calculated. So it's just, oh well, it's a, it, this slide shows detailed procedure how to calculate uh, this uh, correlation between the anatomical frame and then the measurement frame uh, without iteration. This method is based on uh, like a work by Ann Adel in 1987. So you know, they used single probability composition uh, without iteration, and then they could get uh, like uh, the, well, they could calculate this matrix R, and then uh, sequentially, like uh, they could calculate this translation matrix uh, from this equation. But a problem is that I mentioned before, like. Uh, Okay, uh, this jet coordinating measurement frame is not accurate because it depends on the uh, like uh, meeting point of the three rays of beams, but uh, this can uh, include very large errors. So, as a second step, I used I correct uh, I introduced uh, correction factors, quarter correction matrix Q. Uh, in this matrix, at this equation, we use only X and Y coordinate uh, in the like uh, LDB frame. That means uh, we do not use coordinate in the, uh, along the this laser beam because this is not accurate. Then uh, I introduced oil angles and then uh, oil angles so can be uh, calculated by an interactive method such as a Newton Mapson method. So this slide shows the example of reference marker. So we used well, we used this coin shape uh, copper wires. And then uh, we used uh, boundary of these copper wires as the reference point to correlate uh, two um, frames. So uh, boundary, the coordinate of the boundary of the, these uh, markers was measured uh, during uh, in the LGB frame, also obtained from the uh, anatomical frame, then uh, two coordinates are correlated by the equations I explained in earlier slides. This is another example uh, to show uh, another example of the reference markers to correlate. Uh, uh, two frames, and then here's uh, like a silica tube was used uh, as a reference markers, and then we measure the coordinate of the, the end of the this copper wire uh, in the anatomical frame and NDP frame, and then uh, correlate the two frames using these coordinates in both frames using the formulas equations I explained in earlier slides. Then this uh, slide shows like uh, uh, experimental setup for the measurement of three-dimensional vibration of the Melius includes complex, uh, which was done in uh, 2015. So well, artificial ear kernel was attached to the tympani membrane and then microphone and then 
like uh, loudspeaker speaker was uh, connected uh, through the yellow form to the artificial kernel. And then uh, vibrational motion of the temporal, uh, oscular chain of human temporal bone uh, was measured using this 3D LDB system. Uh, to assess many points on the bones, uh, fairly large, wide opening uh, was made. So this flow chart shows uh, the procedures uh, to measure the three-dimensional vibration of the oscular chain, uh, especially the Melius incus complex. So velocities and coordinates in the LGB frame were measured using the 3D LDV uh, for the several points on the temporal bones. And then, uh, then the well, after measurement also the micro T was performed and anatomical frame was made uh, using the 3D volumes obtained from the, these micro T images. Then uh, we correlate the LDB frame and anatomical frame and then uh, we uh, registered all the velocities coordinates the LDB frame into the anatomical frame, and then we calculated 3D lift body motion component in anatomical frame. So also we have uh, these procedures include this, uh, several steps to remove some erroneous data, but uh, I would uh, I would skip the how to remove this erroneous data. So, so these animations show uh, three-dimensional motion of the human temporal bone, especially the Melius incus complex at 500 S and 1 kHz. As you see in the left animation, motion of the umbo is pretty like uh, along the C direction. That means along the lateral and uh, uh, medial directions. So, and then it's likely the hinge-like rotational motion. At higher frequencies, motions become complex and more special. So, well, it's hard to say these motions are like a, a hinge-like rotational motion, but it's also a complex motion. So, Hinge like rotational motion plus something. And then uh, you can see it's like a slight uh, relative motion between the values and incus uh, at the boundary between two oscillators. At higher frequencies, yeah, values. Melius shows uh, more like a hinge like rotational motion, but you can see the uh, motion of the incus as a different pace uh, well, compared to the motion of the values. Also, uh, this uh, incus motion is smaller than the values motion. That means uh, like a fairly large relative motion between Melius and incus occur at higher frequencies. So I would like, I would characterize the motion at high frequencies as like a relatively a small motion of the incus uh, compared to motion of the Melius. So these two figures show the surface a plot of the surface velocity in the direction of the uh, lateral and medial directions uh, to see some kind of uh, rotational axis uh, of the hinge-like rotational motion. Well, if you see maybe rotational axis is passing through these uh, blue lines where the uh, surface velocity uh, in the G direction becomes uh, the small The problem is that uh, in many studies, for the, this hinge-like rotational motion at low frequencies, uh, like rotational axis 
X65-bind uh, esterine vaccine through anterior process of the malleus and then T of short process of the incus. So this uh, rotational axis is generally uh, determined by the anatomy of the middle ear uh, and then also uh, for several species. And then when we compare the uh, labor, labor ratio, uh, generally this rotational axis is used. However, from the measurement, this rotational axis is, is not, we found that this rotational axis is not correct. So in this animation, I showed only the one example, but we performed several measurements, but we never saw uh, the X rotational axis uh, passing through this anterior process to malleus and the tip of the short process. So generally, this uh, rotational axis positioned, like uh, moved to like a superior direction. Yeah. While the malleus and incus motion is uh, full six degrees of freedom, generally the stepis motion is constalled uh, have only the three bit body motion component. That means only this uh, translation of longitudinal direction of the stepis and then two rotations of the hoop plate along the long axis of the hoop plate and then also rotation along the short axis of plate are dominant compared to the other uh, motion component. So, well, it, is, it has been accepted, uh, the studies in this field. So when the people measure uh, the three-dimensional motion uh, of the state piece, they assumed only the three-digit body component one translation and two rotation. And then uh, it's a, uh, well, so they used like a, a simplified method with this reduced degrees of the freedom. With only with this six uh, degrees of the freedom, uh, like uh, if we measure the like, uh, velocities in one dimensional velocities at multiple points at the hoop plate, we can construct like a, a rigid body component of the stepis motion. So this shows that with only uh, this C component of the VOZ, omega X, omega Y, then uh, like this measured motion can be represented by like that. Then for the end point, like uh, equation, this equation becomes like this. Then this equation can be solved you know, using the normal equation. Uh, that is least square method. We also used this, uh, we have used this method to define the locking like motion of the state piece and then translation of the state piece. So, like uh, by measuring 1D, one-dimensional velocities of a multiple point on the whole plate, rigid by the motion of states can be defined. So we do this, like uh, we found that uh, this rotational, this is ratio between the, this rotational motion to the uh, this translation. Uh, this rotational motion is very small, low frequencies, and then becomes considerable at high frequencies of 1.5 kilohertz. But question is that, so well, really this step is motion can be like, a, have a, like a, can be considered the motion with a, uh, reduced degrees of freedom. That is, uh, is in play motion of state plates sufficiently constrained by epidural annual ligament? That's the first question. And then, if it is uh, constrained, then the second question is that how can we find 
couplet-play. Because uh, to define these three component, dominant component, we should know where the, this couplet play. And then from the works by the Laufsmann and the 2012, they found that uh, there exists uh, the whole plane to plane, which minimize the in-plane motion within the sickness. Uh, the, but they found that this uh, like whole plate plane uh, can differ by 7.5 degrees. And then within these ranges, uh, whole plate plane, uh, uh, by, well, depending on how we define the hoop plate plane, this input motion other component can be very large. Uh, very large means in, uh, can be considerable. Also, uh, well, according to the work by the, my colleague, Dr. Sher, it's uh, like uh, this uh, annular ligament have a two face layers and then inclination of these face layers varies along the boundaries. So it's not parallel. And then it has some like uh, convulges, divulges, and there's loft many types. So uh, according to these studies, uh, it is almost impossible to define the whole plate plane uh, which uh, constraint the uh, in-plane motion uh, only from the anatomy. It's the whole plate plane can be defined after we measure uh, the step is motion with six degrees of freedom. So, well, if we start from the like uh, measurement with three uh, degree, uh, degrees of freedom, well, it can be uh, long. I, I mean, it can include some errors because like uh, we don't know where the who plate is, who plate playing is. So as a consequence, like who plate a uh, plane which minimizes the inflation motion. I, I well, actually it just, but uh, uh, it is hard to predefine who plate plane from geometry. Therefore, for more accurate results. Uh, we should measure uh, step is motion uh, with uh, six degrees of freedoms. So now let's move to into the like, measurement of three dimensional vibration of the tympani membrane. Yeah, according according to the Kroyov lobe theory about the thin elastic cell shell. Uh, in the case that the thickness is much smaller than uh, radius of the curvature, like a transverse shear deformation in the shell is uh, small enough to be ignored. So, uh, according to the, this theory, so, uh, like uh, uh, motion component normal to surface, tympanic membrane surface, presumed to be uh, dominant in the vibration of the TN. And then uh, this theory was used in this field for a long time. But however, this theory is, uh, is regarding the like uh, static deformation uh, rather than dynamic motion. Also, this theory was uh, derived uh, using the isotropic and homogeneous shell uh, without like a uh, well, like a big change of the thickness, but actually the tympani membrane is non-isotropic and it is homogeneous, and then thickness is uh, like uh, uh, yeah, it's an, a large variation, but this uh, thickness is varies along the tympani membrane. Also, uh, as I mentioned, this theory was uh, derived for the static deformation, but uh, I want a doubtable. Uh, whether this theory can be applied to this dynamic response. Also, this uh, theory was about the, like uh, uh, isolated shell, but our uh, tympanic membrane was connected to the chain. 
with pretension. So, well, it's doubtable whether this classical thin elastic shell theory can be applicable to vibration of a tympani membrane. So there are, so we decided to uh, decided to measure three dimensional motion of the tympani membrane. Uh, there are many uh, ways to measure this tympani membrane vibration, uh, well, especially the hollow ways uh, generally commonly used uh, recently to measure the vibration of the tympani membrane, but uh, we decided to use the scanning LDB because uh, we have used the, this uh, LDB system for a long time, and then we developed some logics like, uh, to measure the three-dimensional motion of the tympani membrane. And then, uh, like uh, we like analyzed the normal and tangential component of the tympani membrane vibration from the measurement. So first, we started from the isolated uh, tympani membrane. Uh, this tympani membrane was mounted uh, like uh, uh, this artificially a corner was like uh, connected to the, this tympani membrane and then uh, it's uh, like mounted on the uh, column housing and then uh, we use and we made a four like a reference point for uh, for like uh, frame registration between uh, reference anatomical plane and this measurement plane. So, well, it looks a little complicated, but these are the procedures uh, to measure uh, three-dimensional motion of the tympani membrane. Let me uh, like uh, explain uh, step by step. So first, we used like a uh, robot arm, and then we changed direction of the LDB system, that is direction of the laser beam relative to the samples with five different angles. So we measured from the five different angles, uh, vibration of the uh, tympani membrane by scanning all the tympani membrane. So these are uh, like uh, measurement from five different angles. Then, uh, actually, this were done after measurement. We uh, did micro scan for the samples, and then uh, we calculate where we made the three D volumes uh, from the micro images, and then uh, we calculate the like uh, anatomical frame, and then also uh, we like calculate. Uh, the correlation between this measurement frame and anatomical frame using the like uh, coordinate of uh, this reference point, pole reference point. The procedure was the same as I explained uh, in the measurement of the vibrational motion of the Melius in Kuss complex. Then to get the exact uh, like. Uh, measurement point, we also used ray tracing because without ray tracing, uh, actual the measurement point X coordinates should be here, but uh, without ray tracing, so like uh, measurement frame is defined by here. So there is uh, some errors. So well, for the all measurement frame, a uh, measurement point we did ray tracing to obtain exact position and the point uh, where the measurement was actually done. <clears throat> then, because we measured from five different angles, all measurement point in the scanning is a little different. So, well, it's uh, from angle one to three, four, five, has uh, some different point. Then this point, but if, all the measurement point is different, we cannot calculate the three-dimensional component. So uh, this measurement point is combined into one common uh, grid uh, by interpolation. 
and then uh, like uh, uh, velocity component, three dimensional velocity component at each measurement was calculated by from the this measurement component from the measured from the five different angles using these equations. So this shows uh, like a Vx, Vy, Vz in uh, 0.5 kilohertz or 2 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz uh, from the measurement of a specific uh, temporal bone. Then we registered all velocity coordinates to one common grid point in the analytical plane. So uh, as I explained, these uh, four reference point uh, used to correlate between this measurement plane, this analytical plane. So well, the same method was used. Well, same as, as the method for the uh, like uh, I already explained about the plane is correlate of the planes uh, using this reference point in uh, measurement of the various inkers complex. <coughs> and then, like uh, for the, at, uh, at each measurement point, it's a normal vector. It's a vector normal to the surface was calculated. <coughs> and then, no, <coughs> oh, sorry, it's a, and then uh, normal velocity component and this uh, tangential velocity components calculated by these equations. <clears throat> so this shows the normal component, the tangential component at 500 hertz. As you see, it's so like a normal component is like a dominant and then a very negligible uh, tangential component uh, at this frequency. However, at high frequency, at 4,000 hertz, like uh, even tangential component was not negligible. So we found the considerable tangential component at high frequencies. Well, to set up uh, these measurement procedures, we made big efforts uh, to make all processes, but recently, like uh, 3D scanning LPC was developed. With uh, well, we have not purchased this then yet, but with this, uh, with this uh, 3D scanning LDB system, like uh, it's combining the 3D 3D system with the three laser beam and scanning function. Uh, the measurement can be much simpler. Oh, so just one piece, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, so I cannot. This does not work here. So anyway, so like uh, uh, with this system, X, Y, Z component is uh, just some please, sorry. Yeah. Ah, yeah, here. This is now the jet component. So this is Y component. The jet component is the component along the laser beam. Like this is X component. So, well, without this uh, 3D scanning LDB, we had to uh, process all data with very complicated procedures, but with new system, like uh, 
bedlamat becomes very simpler. So this is what we developed with uh, like uh, with only one scanning uh, LDB, but well, by introducing this speed scanning LDB, all procedures here can be reduced than measurement or uh, all process to get uh, 3D component of the membrane becomes simpler. So now I'll direct, uh, move with the static behavior. So, well, the static behavior of the tympani membrane occur under change of the ambient static pressures. And then it's a uh, magnitude of motion is fairly large compared to vibrational motion of the particular chain uh, during sound transmission. And then also like a uh, uh, flexible menu, incodomelia joint contribute uh, to the transmission of this large deformation through the muscular chain. And then uh, this uh, study can be used also like uh, assess like uh, uh, some uh, risks, uh, in uh, risks in surgically uh, reconstructed years. So we used two camera, uh, stereo, uh, it's a two camera uh, to trace uh, this uh, change of the, well, position change of the, this muscular chain under pressure, under pressure change. So we made uh, static pressure uh, into the artificial kernel using this pump and nanometer, manometer. Uh, and then uh, we traced the, like uh, uh, change of position of these beads, fluorescent beads, uh, using this stereo camera system. Uh, this stereo camera system had uh, like an angle of seven degrees, and then it's attached to the robot arm, and then uh, for each control of the position of this camera system. And then uh, for the, like uh, to get imaging, so, uh, to, to assess the values in incus, uh, assess the values in incus was done uh, through the wider uh, white uh, mastoidectomy, uh, which shows in this figure, and the drilled away tectum. Then, assess the stapes was done uh, through the wide mastoidectomy. Then, <coughs> this is the like uh, procedures. Uh, to trace uh, the position change of the muscular position uh, under the static pressure of loads. So we track positions of fluorescent bit on muscle on the pressure load using stereo camera system, and then we calculate rigid body displacements of the position change of the piece. And tracking accuracy was the 10 micrometers. So I would like to explain about more details about these procedures. So, well, once 3D coordinates of the bit from the initial position to the new position uh, is obtained, then like uh, uh, this position change can be defined by uh, rotation and translation. Then, uh, if we get a uh, relation or this kind of this relation uh, for the more than three fluorescent bits, then we can calculate a rotation matrix R and translational matrix T by the similar way I explained for the frame illustration in the vibrational motion. So this is uh, like a quasi static behavior of the middle of osicus on the static pressure ropes. Do you see the, like uh, you can find the rotation about the, this axis from the out of papers into the paper. And then uh, 
can find that the increase motion is like uh, much smaller than values. That means like uh, uh, like uh, increase values motion is uh, absorption of the large values motion occurs at the uh, increase in value joint, especially for the political pressures. So this is comparison between the uh, displacement of the umbo and displacement of the hopeless center. So in the displacement of the umbo, like uh, uh, displacement through the lateral medial direction, it's a G direction, is uh, dominant compared to other like uh, uh, other directions. And then you can see the hoop plate center, like um, uh, motion of the hoop, displacement of the hoop plate is much smaller than the displacement of the umber. If you compare with the well, photo and below photos, you can see a relatively large displacement of the umber, but relatively small displacement of the hoop plate. Also, you can find it that here. So like a, this uh, negative displacement, that means uh, displacement into the medial direction is larger than displacement uh, into the lateral direction. That means uh, like uh, extrusion of the state piece. Uh, extrusion is uh, like uh, that is larger than the intrusion. Such a method was also applied to like, uh, reconstruct the middle year. Uh, uh, this figure shows that the uh, like, uh, motion of the uh, middle year vortices on the uh, static pressure loads for the incus tepidotomy and milius tepidotomy. So, uh, we could have observe that the uh, intrusion under positive pressure in the ear corner and extrusion under negative pressures in the ear corner. Then also, we could observe a kind of like a rotation about these points. So, well, this shows like a motion of the like, uh, Process tip. It is important because if it goes inside too much, then uh, it can damage uh, like a suck a circle, like uh, in the organ in the inner ear. So we traced like uh, uh, like a trace the motion of the uh, displacement of the process tip. Then we found that. Extrusion is larger than intrusion. So if you see so it's this it's the upper like a plus values uh, like, uh, uh, indicates the extrusion and this negative values is so intrusion. So extrusion was larger. Also we found that uh, this uh, displacement larger for the values tabidotomy uh, compared to the incus tabidotomy. Then we could observe a large variation of cross samples. Uh, maybe it is due to the cramping position relative to the penetration. So the, uh, due to the anatomical variation across uh, subjects. So like, uh, I'd like to finish my presentation here. Today, I introduced mechanisms to measure 3D behavior of the middle ear structures. Uh, I hope that uh, it, it provides some beneficial information to you uh, research on your study. Thank you. So finally, I would like to introduce our team. It's like uh, autology and biomechanics of hearing in University Hospital Zurich. More information can be found. You can find the more detailed information uh, at this address. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sim, for the wonderful and very clear and detailed presentation.
Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat now, but uh, you're welcome to address uh, to address us directly. I don't see any questions. Maybe I'll just pose one. Um, what do you see um, um, the next steps using all these techniques? Um, what will be the next frontier to explore? Mm, I'm interested in the like, application of these techniques to other spaces and uh, application for more clinical application to assess the reconstructive years. Thank you. Um, so unless there are any other questions, um, I think we can now conclude. And feel free to um, contact, um, if you have any further questions later on, feel free to contact uh, Jehun on the email, as you can see it listed right now. Thank you very much. Listen, please.